welcome to the BACC Sunday live stream with your host, Russ Yule. Thank you for joining us. We're having a shorter communion service today, so we hope you're sitting comfortably at home, a Cinnabon or two in hand, ready to go. We have a new song for you today, brought to you by Freedom Flows, along with tools to help you get the most out of the live stream service. Visit BACC.CC slash live to download the PDFs for Simple Notes, Doodle Notes, and the Kids Coloring Game. Also remember, we have our socially distant drive-in movie night on August 22nd. To purchase your tickets, visit BACC.CC slash drive dash in. We also detail what you can do to have a fun, safe night out with friends or family. We hope to see you there. Make sure to take a moment to like the video and subscribe to the BACC YouTube channel while you're at it. It increases our reach when you do, and we want you to play a part in spreading the word. Let's get started with our new sing-along, Lead Me to the Rock. The shelter of your wings I'll take refuge in The shelter of your wings You're my tower against the foe Hear my cry, O oh God Answer my prayer Answer my prayer Answer my prayer Hear my cry, O oh God Won't you answer my prayer You're my tower against the foe How to stop worrying and start trusting God. They promised you a shorter service today. Well, we don't know that till we're finished, do we? Great to see everybody. We hope you're doing well. We know we're all enduring a historic time in the world, and it is not easy. And one of the things, if you're like me, you're struggling with is worry. There's a lot to be worried about. We're going to talk about reinventing, rebuilding during the pandemic. Trust, relentlessly resisting the pandemic, or really relentlessly resisting the resistance. You'll see that later. And then we're going to talk about 20 seconds. Lessons from We Bought a Zoo. It's all kind of gobbled up there for you, kind of like a soup made of all the leftovers, and it's going to be tasty treat. Let's start with reinvent. Rebuilding during the pandemic. One of the challenges of life is that we don't know what's going to happen from day to day, do we? Uh, we wake up one day and there's a vaccine coming. We wake up the next day and our city's closed down. We wake up the next day and restaurants are open. We wake up the next day and restaurants are only open on the outside. Then we wake up the next day and the restaurant is out of business. These are not encouraging things and they can work on us. CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and all the other networks are constantly telling us the news, but it's really difficult to get any good news. You say, well, there's no good news out there. I think there is good news and you and I both know there's good news, but it's really difficult to get it because we're constantly hearing about death and about infection. And so I'm not saying these aren't real, they're real, they're serious, but I don't know about you, but I can get more into a grumbling, complaining, unhappy, uh, I'm not prone to melancholy, I'm more prone to complaining mode. And it's all because of a loss of trust, a lack of confidence that God's gonna do something. And so one of the things I think we have to think about, and I say we because it's what I wanna think about, is rebuilding during the pandemic. Not just letting this pandemic rest on top of us and, and crush us, but instead looking at it and saying, how can I come out of this better than I entered it? How about that? How do I come out of the pandemic better 
then I entered it. That's going to be what we really kind of focus on. In other words, reinventing and rebuilding during the pandemic. How's that sound? Good? Reinventing and rebuilding during the pandemic. All right, let's get into that part. Resistance is persistent. One of the things we have to understand in life is resistance is persistent. Lessons from We Bought a Zoo. First, let's understand, in the Bible, the guy who buys a zoo is a guy named Nehemiah. He actually buys a wall. Nehemiah 4.1, when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall. So Nehemiah came to town. You have to read the whole book to get the background. But he basically came to town. Everybody had failed to rebuild the wall to protect Jerusalem. And he came to town and said, okay, I got to get this done. Go read the other part of the Bible, chapters 1 through 3, and you'll get the background on that. But we're going to jump right into resistance is persistent. Because one of the things we have to understand is all of the things going on in life right now are part from the forces of darkness that exist in the world. And they are there to resist us. In Nehemiah 4.1, when Sambalab heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews. And in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? What does Sam Ballot do that we know the forces of evil do? They create doubt. They cause doubt. And they are persistent in their desire to create doubt, to make us doubt God, not trust God. That's what it is. To make us worry, not believe. To make us insecure, not secure. To make us anxious, not calm. That's what they want to do. And so every time we give in to the resistance of the darkness that makes us doubt, that makes us anxious, that makes us negative, that makes us say, no, it can't be done, we end up becoming part of the resistance. We don't want to do that, okay? We don't want to do that. So let's get this down. The resistance persistently seeks to break you down. Have you been broken down lately? Maybe you broke down and ate half the cake instead of just a slice. Have you been broken down lately like me? You stopped doing your exercise regimen the way you used to? Oh boy, guilty. Have you been broken down and you're getting angry now? Angry about nothing? Have you done that? Yeah, I've been broken down like that. Or you're getting broken down and you go, I'm gonna lose my job when you still have a job. I'm gonna lose my house when you still have the house. I'm gonna catch coronavirus and I'm gonna die when you don't have coronavirus and you're not dying. The resistance persistently seeks to break you down. So Sam Ballot, he's the resistance and he's really negative. He puts questions in people's minds. Is it possible? Is it going to work out? Is it going to happen? And he's got a sidekick. Look at this in Nehemiah 4.3. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, a sidekick. See, the resistance always has a sidekick. The negative friend always has a negative friend. That's how they come in twos. Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, what they are building, even if a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stones. One of the things that I have to constantly think is, it's not my family, it's not my friends, it's not my co-workers that are seeking to break me down. It is the forces of darkness, it is evil in this world that is seeking to break us down. The pandemic is not a human-induced pandemic. The pandemic is a forces of evil-induced pandemic. They're going to resist a vaccine coming. They're going to resist safety, health. They're going to try to make sure that we get broken down, and we're getting worn down. That's what's happening. You say, well, how do you know that the forces of evil are the ones creating it? Because God is good. You say, well, what about the Old Testament when God let plays go about? Go back and read your Old Testament and make sure you have your data right on that. Make sure you're absolutely sure you understand about that because there's a whole lot of qualifiers that go into saying God did this. A lot of us say that God did this. We don't know anything. We're human beings down here. We can't even figure out how to stop the coronavirus. We can't even figure out how to wear a face mask. We can't even figure out how to social distance. So we shouldn't be talking to God about, I totally understand what God's like. No, God doesn't want us sick. God doesn't want us dying. The one who wants us to lose our souls and ruin our lives is the devil. That's who wants to do it. And he comes in many forms. In this case, Sambalat and Tobiah, the brothers of discouragement. Sounds like a, a band, doesn't it? Sound like a rock band. Tobiah the Ammonite at his side said what they're do building, what they're trying to do with their lives, it would break down if just a little feather got on it. And the next thing you know, the resistance gets us breaking down. The resistance gets us saying, why even go to church? Why even do midweek? Why even study the Bible? Why even become a Christian? Nehemiah 4.4. How do we answer this? Resilience is relentless. We need to answer the resistance with resilience. That's how you answer it. Not by yelling, not by going on Facebook, but you answer it with resilience. Not by getting frustrated, 
not by complaining, not by being angry, but you answer it, I answer it with resilience. How does that sound to you? We bought a zoo. Benjamin Me is the star of We Bought a Zoo. He's the father of a couple of kids and he's a widower. His kids, Rosie and Dylan, I think it is, they're the children and uh, he goes, we gotta get a new start. He's a journalist. And he decides we're gonna buy a new house. You know, sometimes people think, I'll start my life over, I'm gonna buy a new house. He decides I'm gonna buy a new house. In one of the funniest scenes in this movie, you gotta see the realtor. The realtor and him in the car, it's one of the most hilarious scenes in a movie. You'll recognize the comedian who plays the realtor. And they're driving along looking for houses and finally after failures and failures of finding a house, they land on this house that he thinks, Benjamin thinks is perfect. And then he hears the roar of a lion. <laughs> and uh... he goes, what is that? And it turns out this house is part of a zoo. He has paused and then he sees his daughter, I think out with chickens or something like that, playing with him and he realizes this is the perfect place. And you know what happens as soon as he gets his dream together? Yep. Coronavirus. Okay, it wasn't the coronavirus, but it was his son Dylan hated the idea. His brother Duncan said, you cannot do it. This is a terrible idea. And it turned out the zoo was about to go out of business. And then it turned out they had the staff that was, well, let's just say, if you remember the movie The Dirty Dozen, that's who they were. Then there had a USDA inspector that had to approve the opening of the zoo who didn't want the zoo to open and wanted to close. Resistance is persistent. And throughout this movie, resistance is totally persistent. But what were we just talking about? Resilience is relentless. And so let's take a look. Nehemiah 4, 4. Hear us, our God. That's how Nehemiah answered the resistance. He didn't get out his four color pen and start drawing charts. He didn't get out his Excel spreadsheet and start putting in numbers. He didn't go do a study of, of how do you rebuild walls uh, in, in the wall building book for dummies. He didn't do that. He said, hear us, O God. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. Boy, Nehemiah could pray, couldn't he? Relentless, this guy was. Relentless. And guess what? So was Benjamin me. A turning point in the movie is when he gets into an argument with his son, Dylan. His son Dylan goes, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. I don't want to be here. I hate being here. And Benjamin goes, son, I did this for you. He said, you didn't do it for me. You did it for yourself. And you know what that's like as a parent when you're trying to do something for your kid and your kid accuses you of doing it all for you and you actually didn't want to do it, but you were doing it for them, but they accuse you of doing it for yourself. You know what I'm talking about. And then his son's yelling and he's yelling. The dad's yelling. And he says, why don't you stop complaining? Gail told me that last night. Why don't you stop complaining? It was good. You ever complain too much? I loved it. Why don't you stop complaining? That's what he tells his son. I can relate to it. He says, why don't you help out around here? Why don't you pick something up? Why don't you do something? This is a good dream. It's a great dream. He has to be relentless because so many things are opposing it. It's a great, great dream, but so many things are opposing it. Right now, we are being opposed. Starting in 2020, our church was doing better than ever. So many amazing things were happening. It was awesome, and then we got hit by this. We've gotta be careful not to drown the dream in fear by being resilient in the face of resistance. Trust in God. That's what we're supposed to do. Stop worrying and trust in God. Trust in God makes us relentless enough to defeat the resistance. Do you like that? Even if you don't, I do. Trust in God makes us relentless enough to defeat the resistance. What resistance are you experiencing during this pandemic? It's time to resist it and reinvent yourself. It's time to say, when I come out of this, I'm going to be better than the way I came into it. I'm going to be lighter. I'm going to be sharper. I'm going to be more disciplined. I'm going to be more joyful. I'm going to be more grateful. I'm going to be more impactful in people's lives for the good, whatever it may be. And look at Nehemiah 4, 6. Just like, just like Benjamin and me, Nehemiah kept going and look what happened. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. Ooh.
ooh, ooh, wee. We bought a zoo. Now, we're going to take a memorable moment that fits this perfectly. Sarah Hendricks, we heard her story, but what we realize is a lot of these stories are so good, we've got to rewatch them because there's a little bit of an update about this thing here. But let's take a look at a memorable moment, a story of the week that we've seen but need to see again. Take a look. After Sarah Hendricks was diagnosed with acute leukemia in July 2017, the Stockton and Tracy House Churches supported the Hendricks family tirelessly, including visits, meals, overnight stays in the hospital, and helping care for their children. It was a very challenging time with a cumulative hospital stay of over 200 days, along with a stem cell transplant and stay in the ICU. However, throughout the journey, God worked in many ways. Sarah has been declared cancer-free, and she brought disciples together to support three bone marrow drives, resulting in over 160 people signing up for the bone marrow registry. Since then, Sarah and her family have had an ongoing focus on helping others battle illness. They have been supplying materials like essential oils to help oncology patients cope with chemotherapy side effects for the UC Davis Hospital. Sarah is also helping a friend of hers study the Bible and has started a Zoom group for women with chronic health challenges to support each other. Additionally, she is currently hosting a series of virtual bone marrow drives with the hashtag Couch to Cure movement through BeTheMatch.org. Sarah is much more than a cancer survivor. She's thriving by helping save lives and giving hope to those who battle chronic illness. If you have a story to share, let us know by sending to live at BACC.cc so we can continue to shine a light on the good things people are doing. Boy, Sarah is such an inspiration, as is her whole family. And guess what? Here's an update. Sarah continues hosting a series of virtual bone marrow drives and latest one, Cal State Northridge Studios Association in the BACC East Bay Campus Ministry. How about that? And here's a really cool thing. She was invited to speak with UC Davis Hospital Oncology Professional Governance Clinical Practice Council at the end of last year about her experience and ideas for improving patient support and care. Are you kidding me? Why did we show it again? Because it's not over yet. These stories of the week are the beginning. They're not the end. She's showing us the path that we can reinvent ourselves. And let me tell you what, if Sarah and her family can reinvent in cancer, why can't we reinvent in coronavirus? And guess what? If you've got a story like that, you definitely need to get it into us. And you know why? Because thousands of people watch who have not watched before. In fact, I've got a couple new friends watching. Hi, Don and Vicki. How's it going? Take care of yourself. Don, take care of your health now. You know what I'm talking about. But they're watching only for the second time. And guess what? They hadn't seen that. Remember, it's not about you. It's about all the other people that are coming and constantly wanting to be inspired. And what an inspiring story that is. And that leads us to a big word, trust. Don't worry. Trust. Relentlessly resisting the resistance is about trust. Trust is hard for me. We talked last week about dysfunction and being a, just being dysfunctional or adaptive. A lot of my dysfunctionality has to do with the inability to trust. How about you? Did you see that episode? You should watch it. Have you forgotten that episode? You should watch it. Have you obeyed the things you learned in that episode? If not, you should watch it. If you have, you should watch it again, create a study and share it with a friend. Trust, relentlessly resisting the resistance. Okay, so the first question we got to answer there is, who's the resistance? Yeah, 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 I know. A lot of you thought, hey, didn't we already cover a bunch of this stuff? No, we didn't cover it. We didn't go deep. We didn't go deep like this pie went on that kid's face. We didn't go that deep. Who is the resistance? Okay, first of all, the resistance are, these are the people Nehemiah faced in the middle of this fight. Nehemiah 4.10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. He got hit by the fear super spreaders. These are people who, they're the super spreaders, man. They fear spread fear. The minute they see somebody trying to do something great, the minute they try to reinvent your life, they're there to go, be afraid, be very afraid. Then there's the anxiety people, the sensational super spreaders. Now it says enemies, but follow me right here in Nehemiah 4.11. Also our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll 
kill them and put it into the work. You know, the anxiety sensational spreaders, they don't tell you that there's vaccines being developed for the coronavirus. They don't tell you that 80% of the people don't end up dying and don't end up having severe experiences. The sensational anxious people tell you only about the people who are gonna die die, go watch Freaks and Greek Geeks. It's a great it's a great television series. And I think it's the first episode. They're sitting at the table and the parents are trying to get the team to listen and obey. And so they say, you know what happened to so-and-so? So-and-so took drugs. And you know what happened? She's dead now. I mean, that's how they did it. And a lot of us don't realize our anxiety is making us sensationally spread things that have everybody up in arms. I'm not saying it's not dangerous out there. You don't, I wear gloves, mask. I have, stop it. I know it's dangerous, but these people weren't just telling them it's dangerous. They were automatically going to, hey, you're going to die. Religiosity, the sanctimonious spreaders. These folks, man, they just condescend and don't think you get it. And they, they walk around. They got a bunch of stuff going on inside of them, their own fears. But they are in total denial about their fear, total denial about their anxiety, total denial about their insecurity. And they're just running around doing this. Nehemiah 4.12. Then the Jews... The religious people who live near them came and told us 10 times over. That's just how we are when we're religious. We're like, you don't understand. You don't understand. I read an article. You don't understand. I watched a movie. You don't understand. I read a book. You don't understand. I slept a lot of the end last night and I'm a doctor now. You're not a doctor. Then the Jews who live near them came and told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Wherever you turn. It's ridiculous. And then the insecure people, they're the other kind of spreaders. See, we've got the spreaders of the coronavirus and we've got the spreaders of fear, anxiety, religiosity and insecurity. And really, the religiosity people spread all three. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember, the Lord is great and awesome. See, insecure people, they're always afraid and nervous, but they're silent about it. They sit amongst us insecure, making us all feel insecure. I know you're saying, wow, maybe I'm one of those. Mm, I'm all of those. And you know what? When we're all of those, we cause as many problems as the coronavirus. That's right. Because causing fear can be worse than anything. Causing anxiety can be worse than anything. Anxiety, fear, and insecurity make everything worse. So whatever you got, it's made worse by those ingredients. And guess what? Guess what? Got a little graphic for you. There you go. Look at that. How to stop worrying and start trusting God. Super spreaders of fear. They have a hundred percent risk of infecting other people. Sensational spreaders of anxiety. They have an 80 percent risk of infecting other people. Look at that. Sanctimonious spreaders of religiosity got that mask on, not admitting to themselves that they're afraid. We got, you know, you go to church, you read the Bible, you pray, and suddenly you're like, I don't have any fear, I don't have any anxiety, I don't have any insecurity. I'm just trying to give people information. Sanctimonious. That's what you are. Sanctimonious. 60% risk of infection. And the silent spreaders of insecurity, 20% risk. Because we don't always know it. But if you sit next to them, you'll catch it. Got that? Sure you got that. Relentlessly resisting the resistance. How do we do it? Trust, remember? So let's go through these quickly. Are you ready? Got your pen out? Ready to jot? Here we go. Number one, trust is God reliant. In Psalm 37, three, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Don't try to control it. Number two, trust relinquishes control. Ooh, like that segue? Give God the right to direct your life. Mm -mm. And as you trust him along the way, you'll find he pulled it off perfectly. Psalm 37, five, Ooh, passion translation. Number three, trust is quietly relentless. Mm, mm, mm. Quiet your heart. I need that one. Quiet your heart in his presence and pray. We had a prayer and fasting day on Friday. It's already making a difference. Quiet your heart in his presence and pray. Keep hope alive. If you're spreading fear and spreading anxiety and spreading insecurity, if I am, that we are killing hope. How you doing? Keep hope alive as you long for God to come through for you. And don't think for a moment that the wicked and their prosperity, prosperity are better off than you. And let's review. How about it? Can you get there? Can you admit it? That all your talk is driven by fear, anxiety, insecurity? That that sanctimonious, pretentious attitude of I know it all is driven by religiosity, not by information. 
Hmm. Think about it. Think about it. Number four, trust doesn't worry about timing. Oh, I need this one. This is my own personal quiet time right here. You can listen in. If you bow low in God's awesome presence, he will eventually exalt you as you leave the timing in his hands. Coronavirus can make us try to take control, can it? And try to get control of timing. He's saying, nope, if you trust God, you let him take care of the timing. Number five, trust believes God cares. Oh, wow. Yep, we're talking about love. Pour out all your worries and stress upon him. God can handle it. You know what happens to us a lot when we're fearful and we're anxious and we're insecure and then we're hiding all of them by a religious mask is we end up having tremendous amounts of worry and stress we pour onto people. Some of us can go on long diatribes about how terrible it is, how terrible the economy is going to be, how terrible life's going to be, how half the population is going to die. We need to believe there's a God and that God's not just sitting there impotent. We need to understand something. Let's just talk about a fact. There are 20 vaccines being worked on all over the world. The greatest experts are saying that they believe some could come about as early as late autumn or early winter. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I'm saying, why do you feel the need to kill hope? You're a hope killer. We got to arrest you for hope killing. Stop it. We got to start trusting and believing that God actually cares about us. He actually cares about the people who don't care about him. And that's why he's going to come through. And you know what? When we get our trust on straight, guess what we are? We're this smiling, wonderful young lady and guy with 0% risk of infection because they're spreading the vaccine for infection. It's called faith. That's right. The vaccine for all infections, anxiety infection, fear infection, insecurity infection. The vaccine is faith. And look at how happy they look. You look that happy. I don't look that happy all the time. And so we come to a close. Yeah, we're coming to a close right here. Remember we talked about learning lessons from We Bought a Zoo, Benjamin Me? You know what really turns the movie into just this incredible smorgasbord of inspiration and hope? Is after the argument with his son, they're sitting there watching a tiger who unfortunately is beloved by them but going through health problems, very old. And the son turns to the dad and says, yeah, I want to ask some advice. I like a girl. And they have this conversation where the dad gives him advice. And he says, you know, sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage, just literally 20 seconds of just embarrassing bravery. And I promise you something great will come of it. You know what? We're going to take communion in a minute. And I want us all to think about, have we been displaying even 20 seconds of courage in the face of all we're facing? I know I want to change. I need to change. This is a time for reinvention. And we can all do it and be an inspiration to those around us, keep hope alive instead of killing it, and be able to conquer these three desperate killers of hope, fear, anxiety, and insecurity, and the fourth, which has all of them but hides them behind a mask of religiosity. Let's get rid of all that. And let's get 20 seconds of insane courage, just literally 20 seconds of a just embarrassing bravery. Now, we're going to do something a little different right here, and I know some of us who are really religious are going to freak out. We're going to pray for communion, and then we're going to show you a deep spirituality little commercial. And you know why we're going to show it to you? Because it's going to help us all learn how to find sacred space where we can take our spirituality beyond the live stream into everyday life. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, thank you for the time to take a look at Nehemiah and for the time to take a look at all the promises you give us of what you can do when we trust you. We pray that we'll look this back over, go over our notes, and explore even deeper so we can become the kind of people who instead of worrying, we end up starting to trust you in a way that we've never trusted you before. We love you. We pray you'll teach us through the little video about how to have secret space and find it. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Like any relationship, our intimacy with God will grow based on the amount of time we devote to the pursuit and building of the relationship. But time invested is meaningless if we are distracted. The primary reason we become distracted in our time with God is because we have not selected a sacred space in order to truly start listening to God. Psalm 68 verse 5 in the voice says the true God who inhabits sacred space is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. Some of life's busy distractions for us include worries over what we read in the news, fear of failure in our jobs or academic performance, or stress over our health or finances, for example. To beat these distractions, we can choose to focus our thoughts on God. Isaiah 26 verse 3 in the New Living Translation says, You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. There are six ways to find or create sacred space. Those who live in less populated areas will find sacred space more easily, but those in heavily populated areas can create their own sacred space, even amidst the crowds. Here's how to do it. To find sacred space, consider these options. The forest. Those who live outside cities will find that any wooded area can provide the stillness and peace necessary to meet God. The mountain. Find an elevated spot overlooking your city, or simply a place to experience the peace, beauty, and stillness of nature. The water. There is nothing like a walk on the beach in the early morning, or a location overlooking a lake, or perhaps a walk alongside a river. You can also create sacred space. You have the walk. If you live in the city, it is absolutely possible to map out an intricate and creative walk through the neighborhood. The music. Sometimes you find yourself in the midst of noise. A great pair of headphones combined with a spiritual playlist will create sacred space even in the midst of noise. You can make your own spiritual playlist by finding songs that make you think of God to help you shift your focus to Him. The closet. If all else fails, you can read or pray in a smaller space or create a closet in your backyard or a special table tucked into a corner. This with a cup of coffee or tea and a favorite treat, and you will quickly find yourself being able to read and pray with your total attention on God. You can check out more at deepspirituality.net. Contribution is next, and remember, we're about to finish this building uh, August 31st, and we're adding different things that we didn't expect to add. So continue to give faithfully because it makes a difference. It allows us to, to do our operating right now in the present, but it also allows us to build the future. We appreciate you giving, but want to remind you, let's keep building the future and let's keep giving. Let's not let it slide. Let's keep the fire. Let's not worry. Let's trust God. Here is our PayPal wonderful musical extravaganza. Enjoy. Thank you for joining us. We hope you'll uh, keep joining us and stay in there with us. Uh, yeah, we, this is the end of our communion service, and it's been wonderful to be together. Hey, reach out to people and get online uh, and, and find people to reach out to in our church if you want to join us. You can go to that uh, BACC Live uh, um, page, and you can um, communicate and be able to join up uh, with anybody uh, in doing anything you want to do to be involved in the virtual experience of fellowship. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. And I like to say, even though it wasn't said on the old Batman, same bat place. And guess what we got for you? Not only did we have that wonderful new sing-along, did you notice that? I hope you noticed that. That was a brand new style and new sing-along. We've got a fresh freedom flows for you. That's right. And it's called, you know what it's called? Don't worry about, don't worry about a thing. Enjoy. Have a wonderful week.
taking the things not worth having. Don't you worry. Don't you worry about a thing